Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about normal force and tension, which are two types of forces which typically pull objects upward. Now it's not always the case, but it usually is. So I figured these two would be good types of forces to pair together in a video. So first we'll look at normal force. Picture a flat ground and then imagine that an object is on top of it. What kind of forces can you imagine are in this situation? Well, since that object has mass, you can assume that gravity is going to pull on it with a certain amount of weight. As a reminder, weight is the amount of force that gravity pulls on an object with, and it's always directed downward towards the center of the Earth. So this arrow that we've drawn on the box pointed down represents the amount of weight that the box has. Now, we've learned about Newton's laws of motion, and this is the only one of Newton's laws which is typically represented by an equation. This is Newton's second law of motion. So, it says that the net force on an object, meaning all the forces added up, is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of the object. So, there's a couple things that we can think about when we look at this formula and apply it to the situation of this box on the ground. First thing we can notice is that the box is not moving. Whenever you put something on the ground and it just sits there, you can pretty easily logically deduce that no motion is occurring. Now, if there's no motion, that means that the object is not accelerating. It's not getting faster and faster and faster. So in this case, acceleration is equal to zero. Now looking at Newton's law of, of uh, motion here, if A is equal to zero, then that means that the net force on that object must also be equal to zero because taking A as zero and multiplying it by any amount of mass would equal zero net force. So if the net force is equal to zero, then the final conclusion we can draw is that the box must have balanced forces acting on it. In other words, that weight force is being counteracted by some other type of force that's preventing the box from falling down into the center of our planet. It's supporting its weight. So what is this mysterious force? Well, it's called the normal force, and it's one of the two types of forces we're going to learn about today. The normal force, and it's called that because it is everywhere all the time, the normal force is an upward force from a surface to support an object's weight. It's typically represented with a F and a subscript capital N. So that brown arrow that you're seeing is representing the normal force that the ground is putting onto the box in order to counteract the force of gravity pulling downward. Because these two forces are balancing out, they're completely equal to each other and canceling each other out, the result is that there's no net force in the box, and as a result, the box does not accelerate. Here's an important note to make. Normal force and weight, these two forces that are acting on the box, are equal anytime the object is resting on a surface. Now I say anytime, there are exceptions to this, but the simple examples we'll start out this year seeing are going to be situations in which weight and normal force are equal. So let's take the situation and let's add one element to it. Let's say that a cat comes along and sits on top of this box. What's going to be the effect? Well, the cat also has mass. So as a result, gravity is going to pull on the cat's body and generate extra weight force. So this extra little arrow that I've added on the bottom represents the cat's weight, which is being applied to the box, which is being applied to the ground. So as far as the ground is concerned, there is a now heavier box pushing down on it. Now you know from experience that when you stack objects on top of each other, that doesn't immediately make them fall down to the center of the earth. So this cat's weight is going to be counteracted by some additional normal force. Because the ground had extra force pushing down, the ground had to make up for that by applying an extra normal force. Now again, why is it called normal force? It's because any object that is sitting on a surface is going to experience a normal force. Now you glance around the room that you're in right now and try to count how many objects are sitting on a surface. It's every single object. Even objects that are hanging on a wall are technically experiencing a normal force from the nail that they're hanging on or whatever's suspending them. So normal forces are one of the most normal forces you can experience in your everyday life. So what causes a normal force? That's what I want to look at next. Again, a normal force is defined as the upward force from a surface which supports an object's weight. Here you can see a diagram of a box that's going to be put onto a table. And if there's no contact between those surfaces, then there will not be a normal force. But as soon as you put that box onto the table, the table is going to be compressed and that compression is going to cause it to want to push the box back up. So 
If you can imagine the molecules of the structure of the table that you just put your box on, you can imagine that the molecules are connected by a bunch of springs. Now in reality it's not springs, it's intermolecular forces, which is much more complicated. But if you imagine that springs hold the atoms together, then when you put a box onto your table, you're compressing the springs that tie those molecules together. What happens when you compress a spring? Well, it becomes tighter and more pent up, and if you release it, it will expand. So there's a restoring force that springs are able to put onto their environment when they are compressed. And that's essentially what happens on surfaces when you put objects onto them. And that's where the normal force comes from. It's the force of the springs or intermolecular forces being compressed. So this is the reason why when you sit on a chair, which you might be doing right now, your butt does not fall to the floor. It's because while your weight is putting a force down onto the chair, the chair is putting a normal force back onto your butt. And because those two forces are equal, you stay perfectly still, hopefully, if it's a good chair. Now, normal force has a few rules to it. One of the rules is that it's always going to be exerted onto an object perpendicular to the surface. What does that mean? That means that if you're sitting on a flat surface, the normal force from that surface onto you is going to be up at a 90 degree angle. But if you sit on a slant or ramp, then the normal force is going to be perpendicular to that ramp, not to the ground. So you're always going to have normal forces that are exactly 90 degrees to the surface that the object is on. Just like in this image where a box is sitting on a ramp, and instead of the normal force pointing straight up, the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. That's something to keep in mind. I want to talk about scales because we've already mentioned in physics how a scale measures weight, but that's actually not true, and now we know enough information to demystify scales a little bit. So fun fact, a bathroom scale, like the one this guy's standing on, does not actually show your weight. Let's talk about that. When you stand on a scale, your weight compresses a spring on the inside of the scale. As a result, the compressed spring produces its own pushing force, which you could call the normal force, to support your weight. So as you compress the spring, it tries to push back up. That's normal force. This force pushes your body up with a strength that is equal to your weight. The two equal and opposite forces balance each other out and add up to a net force equal to zero. So this guy would have a normal force being put onto him of 800 newtons because you can see in the diagram that his weight is 800 newtons. So which one is the scale actually measuring? Is it measuring his weight of 800 newtons or the normal force of 800 newtons? Well, there's one easy way to test this. Just turn the scale sideways and you'll notice that as soon as you're no longer applying any pressure to the scale, it will read zero newtons of weight. So the man's weight doesn't change when he's suddenly not on the scale anymore. He still weighs 800 newtons, and yet the reading on the scale does change when you're not applying pressure to it anymore. So what that tells us is that the scale is actually displaying its own normal force that it puts out. So can a scale directly tell you your weight? No. The only thing a scale can tell you is how hard it has to push up in order to support you. So if it doesn't have to support you at all, it will read zero because that's its normal force. Fun fact. Let's apply this fun fact to a sample physics problem. You put half of your body weight onto a scale, not your whole body, just half your body, and the scale reads 650 newtons. What is, and this is a multi-part question, what is the normal force that the scale is pushing up on you with? Okay, so what is normal force? Well, we're told that the scale reads 650 newtons, and we just learned that scales tell us normal force. That's directly what they report. So since the scale displays normal force, and we're asked, what is the normal force? Then the answer is simply 650 newtons, because that's what it said the scale reads. Number two, what is the weight of your entire body? Well, in the problem, it says that you're putting half of your body weight onto the scale, and the scale read 650 newtons, so that's how much effort it had to put up to support half of your body weight. The other half of your body weight is being supported by the floor, in which we're not getting any measurements from. So very simply, I'm gonna move myself out of the way here. Very simply, since half of your body weight was that 650 newtons represented, just double that number and that's your weight. And then the last part, what is the mass of the person on the scale? Well, that's gonna to relate to a formula, which is weight equals mass times gravity. We're solving for mass, so divide both sides by g, and we get weight divided by gravity equals mass. Plug in the two numbers that we know. From part two, we got that the weight of this person is 1300 newtons. And because we're assuming that this is taking place on Earth, because that's where most humans live, we assume that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81. 
put these two numbers together, and you get that the mass of this person is 132.52 kilograms, which is actually rather large. So that brings us from normal force to the other type of force that we're going to talk about today, which is tension. So what is tension? A simple version of this word means to stretch something. To put something under tension means to stretch it. And when you stretch something, like a spring, it tries to snap back to its original size. And so there's a force generated when you tug on something like a rope or a string. So tension can sometimes be described as the force exerted by a rope, a cable, a chain, etc. And it's called the force of tension. It's either represented by an F with a subscript T or just with a T, depending on where you look. So in this diagram, you can see that there is a ball suspended by a chain and the tension force is directed upward because the rope is above the object that's being suspended. And as the ball drops and its weight pulls down, the rope is being stretched, but it doesn't want to stretch. And so to stay the same length, it applies a force back up. Typically where you'll see problems with tension is when something is suspended, like it is for the crane or for this box that's being suspended by a, uh, a string with some hooks. Um, so anytime something is hanging by a rope or a string, you should expect to be solving for the tension force. So I'm going to show you an example of this. Here's our sample problem for tension. A 700 Newton girl sits on a swing that has a weight of 50 Newtons, including the chains and seat. The girl and the swing are in equilibrium. How much tension force is felt by each of the chains in order to support the seat and the girl? So there's a couple of bits of important information hidden in here, but I'm just going to take this step by step. Um, they're asking how much tension force is felt. There's all kinds of Newtons in here, which are other forces. So there's a lot of forces going on. Typically, when you're doing a forces problem, you want to start out by making a free body diagram, which is a diagram of the object in question and all of the forces applied to it in different directions. So I'm going to start my free body diagram by just drawing this, the seat of the swing, and I'll think about all the forces affecting it. First thing I notice is that there's a girl sitting on the swing. That's obviously important. Uh, the weight of the girl was given as 700 newtons. I'm going to draw that downward because weight always points down because it's caused by gravity. So now that I have that, what else is important? Well, they tell me that the swing itself weighs some weight uh, and that weight is 50 newtons, which is also directed downward because again, it's a weight and weights are always pointed down. Are there any other forces? Well, the chains of the swing are actually what hold it up. And in order for the seat to support the weight of the girl, those chains are going to have to have a tension to them that yanks upward to fight against gravity. So I'm going to draw in two tension forces. That F with a subscript T represents tension. And there's two chains, so I'm drawing two tension forces. I'm going to assume that those two chains are equally supporting the weight of the chain. So whatever this number is for the tension force, it will be equal on these two arrows. So that's my free body diagram. Now it's time for me to do a little bit of math. The place I'm going to start from is that it says the girl and the swing are in equilibrium. Equilibrium is a fancy way of saying everything is balanced and no one thing is bigger than another thing or there's no winner. So that means that all the forces upward should be equal to all the forces downward. They should cancel each other out. That's what equilibrium means. So I'm going to write out this formula. It says that the net force on the swing is equal to the force of tension in the first chain plus the force of tension in the second chain. And then I'm going to subtract the other two forces. Now, why would I subtract some and add others? Well, I'm going to choose the uh, upward direction as positive and the downward direction as negative. That's going to be my way of communicating to my formula which uh, directions or which forces oppose other forces. So up means positive, down means negative. So in this question, they're asking us to calculate how much tension force there is. And those are the purple FTs down there. Because I'm going to calculate those, I want to isolate them in this formula and get everything else on the other side. So I'm going to subtract, or actually, I'm going to add the orange and brown terms to the other side. So adding the weight of the girl and the weight of the swing to the left side of the equation, now it looks like this. I've used one step of algebra to rearrange my formula to make sure that the tension forces are on one side and all the other variables are on the other. Now, I have to actually start plugging things in now. So now I have to read back into the question and see uh, what I should plug in. What is the net force? Well, they say the girl and swing are in equilibrium, which means all the forces are balanced and cancel each other out. So there should be no net force on the swing. So net force should be equal to zero. That's the part that I think some students would miss. So be looking for the word equilibrium to tell you that the net force is zero. Uh, weight of the girl was 700, so we plug that in. 
weight of the swing was 50 newtons, so we plugged that in. And now on the other side, we're still left wondering what is the tension force in the first chain and what is the tension force in the second chain? Let's put the left side of the equation together. We get a total of 750 newtons, and that equals the two chains of tension. Now, in this question I mentioned earlier, we're assuming that the two chains equally pull upward. So if two equal upward pulls equals 750, I can probably just divide that 750 in half and assume correctly that that's going to be the tension in each of the two chains. Because that's what the question was really asking. How much tension force is felt by each of the chains, not both in total? So 750 divided by 2 will give me the tension force in each. That comes out to 375 newtons. So that was the answer to my question. I'm going to stick that 375 up there in the diagram. And now we can add up these numbers and see that they balance out. And in fact, we do have equilibrium. 375 plus 375 equals 750 newtons upward. And down below, we have 700 newtons plus 50 newtons equals 750 down. So the up equals the down. Therefore, it's an equilibrium. Now, one thing you might be wondering here is what happened to normal force? We haven't talked about that for a couple minutes. Is normal force something that's in this situation? Well, it is. The girl is sitting on the swing, and yet she's not making the swing fall down to the center of the earth. So you could say that the seat is putting a normal force onto this girl's butt. Um, and we didn't represent that because we chose to talk about tension force instead. But you could say that because the chains are tugging up on that seat, the seat is able to push up on the girl with a force that is equal to the tension force. So we could say that there's 750 newtons of force pushing upward as well. Um, so that was a video about normal force, which is something that a surface puts onto objects, and tension force, which is a pulling force from chains and ropes that suspend things. So I hope that video was helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.